come to this passage this morning, and uh, I trust that your heart will be open uh, to how God would, would work. Um, you know, we open the Bible, and really it's of no value to us if we don't let God's Holy Spirit work. You know, Satan today will use many things to distract us from God's message. Uh, it could be even other things we have on our schedule today. Uh, but may we not allow anything, any things that have happened this week, uh, to get in the way of the Spirit working today. We need God's Holy Spirit to work in our life. If we are going to grow as a Christian, we need God's Spirit uh, to be working. We come to Daniel chapter 1, and, and I appreciate this, the song that Brother Charles sang earlier. And the song was called, Come, let us return to the Lord. We find in the nation of Israel in Daniel chapter 1 that sadly uh, they were a ways away from returning to the Lord. But they were going to be in a stage now where God was going to call them closer to Himself by some things that they were about to face going into captivity in Babylon. The Bible tells us that God allowed it to happen. And God often allows things to happen in our lives for a reason. And the nation of Israel was, was a people uh, that oftentimes did not have time for God in their lives. They had replaced God many times with idols and with other gods of the other nations that were around them. We find in this passage that, that here the nation of Israel was being allowed of the Lord to be led into captivity. All oh, that we might have more time for God in our life. We see that this nation is going to be a nation that will soon find that, that I should have had time for God. I should have made more time for God. At times in our schedules, we may stretch ourselves so much that, that God cannot work in our life because we won't make room for Him to work. I was thinking of uh, maybe you've been around children and maybe you've had children, and when they get a toy that they uh, like to both of them or all of them would like to play with but only one of them thinks it's for them what normally happens is they all begin to latch onto that toy and, and one kid grabs on one side and they all begin to put their hands on that toy and, and before they know it they've broken the toy and the toy has become useless and they can pull and they can stretch on that toy thinking hey it's for me it's for me and before they know it, as that toy is no longer of any value, they no longer want to play with it. The toy has no purpose anymore. Oh, you can have it. I don't want it anymore. I'll play with something else. Many times in our Christian life, our schedules may make us so busy that we are getting pulled in all kinds of directions and stretched and pulled and, and yanked on, and we're, we're feeling like, God, I am so stretched. I, I cannot do anything more than what I am doing. But you know what we're missing out on? We're failing to put God in His rightful place in our life schedule, and we fail to have a proper time for God. The nation of Israel had time for many of the things that they wanted to do, to partake in. Many times they lived an up-and-down battle in their life. Christians, it is not God's will for you and I to live an up-and-down battle in our life. God always wants us to be moving upward and maturing more and more every day and never going backwards. We must always be moving forward in our life as a Christian. But sadly, the nation of Israel is a picture of you and I. Here this nation has brought idolatry into their, to, their, to their country. They have brought idolatry in, and, and they began pushing God out of the picture. And God says, no. He says, I must be in the picture. I must be a, a vital part in your life. And Christians, we cannot push God out of our life. We need to make sure there is always His rightful place. And it shouldn't be at the very end of the day when we fall asleep during our devotional time. Where is God on your priority list? You may have a list that you keep of things that have to be accomplished. Uh, maybe the day ahead you have a, a things to do list and and maybe you begin to prioritize what needs to be done. You may have that list and nothing ever gets done on that list. But maybe there's that list that you have some things that you kind of mark it as being critical. These things are, it, it is vital that I get these things done today. And then maybe we have a list for, 
for things that we want to do, things that we enjoy. Maybe there's a football game on television that we need to watch or we need to watch. There are some other things that we, we do that we enjoy, and it's a time of relaxation, and, and we make room for that in our schedule, and, and then we make room for the other things that maybe aren't as important, but we get those things done as well. I wonder, where does God fit in that list? Where does God fit in, in your, your daily schedule that you lay out for every day? Where does God fit in? Is He one of the critical things that must be done, that must be accomplished? Webster defines the word priority as something that is more important than other things and that needs to be done or dealt with first. Christians, God ought to be the priority in your life. As he defines something or someone that is more important than other things, it needs to be done. We need to meet with God first and foremost before we ever face the day, before we ever move into the rest of our day. Daniel was a man that knew the Lord. Daniel was a man that walked with God. We see in this passage that uh, there were four Hebrew men that were chosen out uh, by the king's request uh, to, to begin to understand the, the Chaldean language and uh, the things of their time. But understand that Daniel gave priority to his God. Daniel gave God his rightful place. The higher the priority you give to God, the closer you will become to Him. You put Him number one, He's going to be that number one friend in your life. You put Him number three, and you're going to have other things ahead of Him. What if you went uh, into the post office and and you paid for overnight shipping for something, and you saw it, uh, it was delivered ten days later? You would think, hey, You know, I paid, I I prioritized that, I I wanted that to come first. I I wanted you to put that on your list of getting that there tomorrow, but you delivered it 10 days later, we'd we'd be up in arms. You know, I paid a lot of money for that. And it's truly amazing how fast we can move things around this world uh, when the the services prioritize uh, that. But I wonder how much effective time do we have with God because we prioritize that in our life. Many times if we're not careful, we rush through it and didn't really even learn anything. I read my chapters. Man, I got other things to do today. I don't have time to sit and just listen to God. We don't say that, but oftentimes that's what we do. We sit there at our devotional time, we open God's Word, and we begin to think about the day's schedule, all the things that lie ahead. You know what's a good thing to do? have a piece of paper next to you, and if you think of something that has to be done, write it down and then move back into your devotions. Continue on. Because that's what Satan is going to do when you sit down to meet with God. He's going to think of every distraction he can to pull you away from the time that you have with God. That time ought to be something that we see as nothing else is able to distract us from. Something I struggle with is getting up early in the morning. I set my alarm, and it's so frustrating for me because I cannot get up past a certain time. I'm not going to tell you what time that is. Uh, I have to be at work at 7, so that kind of gives you an idea. Uh, But but I have this problem where I cannot wake up early, but I I long to, and and, and I'm really asking the Lord to help me, to get me up earlier so I can spend more time with Him uh, before I go into the day ahead. Christians, it's vital that we have our time with God before the day. Because if we don't have God in our day, man, it's going to be a horrible day. It's going to be a miserable day. We need God in our life. We need to prioritize Him. First of all, in Daniel's life and and these these four Hebrew men in their lives, we see that God was the priority in their knowledge. God was the priority in their knowledge. God had allowed Israel to be led into captivity, obviously for a reason. God always allows things in our lives for a reason. It it could be for, for the simple fact of just correction and then instructing us on how we can become closer to Him. God may allow some kind of a great trial to come into our life that we were not expecting, uh, and wonder, God, why did you allow this to happen? Little do we know that God is preparing us for the next step to come in our life. And God is getting us ready, and God is drawing us closer to Him. The sad thing is we may respond in the wrong way, and turn bitter and actually get farther away from Him. That's not what God intends. 
God's intention is that we would come closer uh, through these trials. We see in verses 3 and 4 of our, our text here that King Nebuchadnezzar requests uh, that men be brought to him for the purpose of teaching them the Chaldean culture and the wisdom of the Chaldean people. We see in verse number 3, The king spake unto Ashpian as the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So we see here the king's desire to get these men, uh, these Hebrew men here, that he could bring in and teach them the things that, that he wants them to learn. And these things would not be things that would bring honor and glory to God. You see, Babylon was a city that was steeped in idolatry. And it's amazing to see that a nation of Israel that was struggling with idolatry, that God would allow them to come into that city. But, but really, I think he was leading them into something that they could see the consequences when we go after things that God never intends us to have. And he allowed them to enter that city and to see uh, what the influence was on those people. And the king was looking for some young men that he could call out and could teach them uh, the things, the way of their culture and many of their beliefs, the, the things of astronomy and eventually becoming astrology and worshiping uh, the stars and the planets and the sun and the moon and all of the things that we would see in space and, and really... Uh, worshiping the idols and understanding how all of that worked, understanding their culture. But you know, there was something that the king was looking for in these young men. Basically, he was looking for the top-notch guys of the day. And these were young men. Understand that Daniel was probably a teenager when they were led into Babylon. Daniel was simply a young person. It's in that time that a young person is moldable and shapeable. It is in that time, and don't think for a moment that you can't shape a teenager because God can still shape their heart. God can still make them what He wants them to be. But you know what? It has to take us yielding ourselves to Him and allowing us to be used to teach them. But we see that, that Nebuchadnezzar realized, hey, these young men are in a moldable time. They're in a time where I can probably influence them to do everything that I would want them to do, uh, to follow my commands, my goals, my ambitions, the, the visions that I would have. And Nebuchadnezzar looks for, for the men that have everything in line. Everything is just perfect. Why? That they may stand before the king, or stand in the king's palace. That they could be there, basically, for his every a beckoning call that he would place on their life. The king was hoping to use the great characteristics or the potential for his own purposes. Understand today that God is not looking for potential. We may have potential. We may have talents. We may have abilities that, that God has blessed us with. God is not looking for potential in our life. We may think, well, that young person, he's got everything in line. He, man, he's going to be dynamite for the Lord. Sadly, a lot of those young people that seem to be dynamite for the Lord are complete failures. God is looking, the Bible says He has used the foolish thing to confound, confound the wise. God is looking for those that are, are empty of themselves so He can then work through us. We give God His rightful place. You see, these young men gave God the rightful place in their knowledge, in their understanding. The king desired to equip them for everything that, that they needed to live in the current world. I wonder how much are we allowing our world, our society, to influence our homes today? How much are we allowing uh, the world today to enter into our living rooms and teach our children things that we shouldn't be letting them teach them? My kids watch some, some cartoons from time to time, and it, it's almost as if you have to sit there and watch the cartoons with them today. Better yet, it's probably better if we just shut the cartoons off. It is unbelievable the things that are being taught to our children just in cartoons. The morals that are being taught or the lack of morals. It is incredible. And sadly, the television has become a babysitter 
for a lot of our families today where the parents do not have to be involved with the children. The children are left to themselves and they're left to make their own decisions and to gain their own knowledge. Christians, that's a failure on our behalf. We ought to be raising our children according to what God would have us to be teaching them. The television is destroying our homes today. I'm not going to stand here and preach against it, but you know what? Satan has used it in many ways in many people's lives, and it's destroyed them. We need to be careful. Lifting sports heroes up, and, and I love sports, and, and I have the certain sports that I enjoy watching and participating in, but we exalt sports heroes farther than a lot of the people in the Bible that we see, and we're making a big mistake. Because the lifestyle they live in the background that you and I do not know about, we ought not be promoting and showing that we back those people up. We love sports, and that sports are a good thing. I believe God uh, has allowed them for, for entertainment and for us to get exercise. But we, may we never make that our priority in our life for our children. Man, I would love if my child would get into the National Hockey League or the National Football League or, or if he would be one day a celebrity, if he would be a, a movie star and make lots of money. Those are great ambitions, but Christians, I don't believe for a moment that's what God wants for your young people unless he wants them to be involved in being a witness. But sadly, in many of those sports realms, they participate in sports every day the church meets. And they're missing out on what God has for them. The sports heroes are exalted today. The movie stars, the pop stars of today, those that are involved in music, they are being exalted before our young people and we're failing to show them that those things are wrong. Christians, these young men had a foundation already of knowledge of God. You know how we see that? Because we look at their names that they already had in verse number 6. The Bible says, Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. All four of these names have something to represent the true God, the God of Israel, the Almighty God. But for some reason, Nebuchadnezzar sees the importance of changing their names to mean something about a God that exists in Babylon. But what I want you to notice in these names, these names represent a heritage. Their parents are not named in this passage. But you know what? The names that their parents gave them are listed in this passage. And what they mean is really that those parents wanted those young people to know the Lord. They wanted those young people to have a good understanding, a good grasp of the things of God. I don't know where their parents are. They were probably separated during uh, the time of captivity. I don't know. But what I do know is they gave them names that would hopefully direct them to the Almighty God. And I believe they gave them a foundation. Christians, if you have a child today, you ought to be taking every minute, every moment you have to teach them about the Lord. God ought to be a priority in our knowledge and our understanding. They had a foundational understanding of God took priority we see secondly this morning God was the priority in their character God was the priority in their character the king had commanded that through this training time these men would partake in all that he had to offer them as if it was necessary for them he says in verse number five the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. We see here that the king's desire was that these men would learn to depend on him. They would learn that, that I'm going to follow exactly what this king says, almost as if he would begin brainwashing them by, by him providing everything, by him changing their names, that these men would be there for that king. As I was reading this passage, the the thought stuck out to me in the end of verse 5. It says that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Think about that this morning. You and I will one day stand before a greater king. This is just King Nebuchadnezzar. He died and he's gone many years ago. You and I have a responsibility to be prepared to stand before the greater king one day. To take the provisions that he has for us. And also to give those to our children. Because you know what? Your children will have to stand before the king as well. What are we investing into them? How much knowledge are we putting into their life? How much understanding of the things of God are we giving them? The Lord had already impressed on Daniel's heart 
to continue on in what he had already learned. Verse number 8, the Bible says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You say, what would it have hurt if Daniel would have taken the meat? I mean, what's wrong with meat? We must understand that, first of all, it was against the Mosaic law to take part in, in eating of those things that were offered to him. But secondly, these were things that more than likely would have been offered to the idols uh, whom the nation of Israel should have had no part with. And Daniel says, he said, what I already have, the knowledge, the understanding I have of God is sufficient for me. I can continue to live by that. I can continue to move forward through my life without needing those things. It's amazing when we look at the diet uh, that the Hebrew people were given. I mean, if you look at the book of Leviticus and you read it and you think, I'll be glad when I'm done, when that's done in my Bible reading. But when you read it, it's amazing how much is in there that would still apply to us today if we would heed to it. In our Bible Institute on Tuesday nights, Brother John Yates has been teaching and he's talked a lot about the, the Jewish diet and the things that they ate and how really if we took part in that today, how much better off we would be health-wise. Brother Yates is the teacher in the institute by way of a DVD we have. Uh, he tells how many years ago he suffered some great physical uh, things in his life, some, some great physical battles. And he decided to go with a diet straight from the Bible. And he had doctors that were questioning how in the world he was as healthy as he was because he, he stuck with that. And he said, look, it's right here. You know what the Bible shows us in things of medical today? These are things that m uh, people in, in medicine, practicing medicine, that are, are continuing to research. These are things that have already been taught in God's word and should have applied to us a long time ago. But we take a while to catch up with that. The Bible is always profitable for us. Amen. And what we see is that Daniel knew that what he already had was sufficient. Yeah. What he already lived by was sufficient. We do not need to add anything else to God's word in order to make it sufficient for you and I. We need to understand that what God gives us already is enough for us. We don't need anything else with it. Daniel's attitude, though, was an attitude of proper response. Daniel didn't get out his sign and say, I protest. I will not be a part of this. You know what? Daniel approached it in a spirit of humility. Daniel simply came to the prince and requested, the Bible says, Requested. We have a lot of Christians today, and you read of it on the news, and you hear about people getting put in jail for this and that. And Sadly, they get stuck on an issue, and they push that issue to the extreme. And really, they're doing more hurt to the cause of Christ, and they're helping it. It's those kind of people that, that if we're not careful, uh, they can push those issues, and, and they can hinder the cause of Christ, and uh, but we, we fail to see that God doesn't expect us to stand out there and protest everything, but to simply preach the truth, to preach righteousness. Daniel approached in a spirit of humility to the uh, basically was concerned more about his own life. He said, I fear the king, and I fear that you guys will not be uh, ready to stand before the king. But then Daniel continues on. He doesn't uh, get all up in arms, but he continues on to the person that was put underneath of that prince, directly over that. So we see there, Melz, Melz, Melzar, Melzar. He is the man that was put over Daniel and the other men. And he went to him. He said, he said, at least prove us. He said, give us 10 days. Try it out. All we need is water, and all we need is pulse to eat. You say, man, that must have been some kind of supernatural thing that God allowed them to live. No, these things were sufficient for them. This would have been just something they could have eaten. A normal diet. You think, how did they live without the meat and all of that? God was going to sustain them as he already had. And we see in this passage that the, the man uh, agrees to them. And he says, fine, we'll, we'll give you a test for 10 days. He said, prove us. The Bible tells us, Malachi chapter 4 and verse number 10, that we need to prove the Lord. 
We need to put him to the test and see what he can really do. How often have we done that? Put God to the test and prove him. I think the more we prove God, the more in awe we will be of, his, of him, of who he is. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is 2 Chronicles 16 and verse number 9. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. You know what that means to me? That means if my heart is completely focused on God in my life, God is going to show me his ability. And he's going to show the world his ability through me. And he can do that through each one of you if you will let him. The Bible said it is those whose heart is per perfect towards him. It is God that gives us the success daily in our life why would we need to depend on anything in the society uh, to give us that? God blessed them, and they had more than they needed. Look in verse 15. It says there, Their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Maybe he started looking for the box of cookies or, or the desserts that they had stashed. No. You see, what they had was sufficient. Christians, we have God's word. Have we applied it to our hearts? Are we living it out in a character as Daniel and these three Hebrew men? Are we living it out daily and having confidence in the fact that, hey, God is sufficient for me. God is enough. Let me encourage you. If your child is involved in any form of secular training, whether it be a public school or a university, I'm not, and I'm not going to say anything bad about those, but let me encourage you that your children need a good, strong, spiritual foundation of God's Word before they ever enter into this society because Satan will use society to destroy our young people. Your young people and our young people need to have a foundational knowledge of God's Word before they ever enter any other field, any career that God would have for them in the future. They need to have knowledge of God. I have a family member that I'm thinking of right now who was once in church and was raised in, in a home, uh, really uh, wasn't necessarily Christian, but she went to church. And then she went invo got involved with university and the, the mindset, the teachings. And again, I'm not downplaying the universities that are, we have a lot of people that are involved in that, and that's great. But what I want you to understand is to face the things that are being taught, we must be prepared by having a good foundation in God's Word. Because we will be taught some things that may sound like the truth, but are far away from it. That's what Satan uses. Things that sound like truth, but aren't truth. We need to be careful to make sure that we are prepared and that we're people of character. Webster defines character as the way someone thinks, feels, and behaves. Reputation. It's the, a moral excellence and a firmness. It's the ability to not turn away from what's already been taught, to continue on, knowing that what God has given to me, my knowledge, my understanding, and through my character, I will live it out for the Lord. The next three years, they received the training, but at the end, it was the knowledge that God gave them that they lived by, and God blessed them for it. Let's look in verse number 17. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Look in verse number 20. Or sorry, let's read verse 19. And the king communed, communed with them, these men that were then brought before him after three years. Among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding, the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians <coughs> and astrologers that were in all his realm. What I want you to notice here is don't ever think for a moment that if you encourage your young person to go to Bible college for a year, that you are keeping them from something. You are keeping them from getting into their career. Don't ever think that they are missing out on something. Don't ever think that just because you come to church on Sunday, you spend the day here, it doesn't mean you're missing out on anything. The society will want to teach you and I that we are missing out on something by being involved in this Christianity. 
This last, just yesterday, there were some guys at work that were going to go to a, a bar last night and they were going to watch something on TV and they were going to have a good time. And, and my brother and I, I'm blessed to be able to work with my brother at a construction site. We were invited. And I said, no, thank you. And the question was asked to me, why, do you have something better to do? I said, I always have better things to do than that. You can be sure of that. You will never have to worry about me ever considering that. The society may say, hey, you need to be there. We're going to have a great time. Oh, I'm sure you're going to have a great time. I can just see you stumbling out that door when you're done, and you call that a great time? Don't believe it. Television today says you'll have a great time if you get involved in this, if you come to this activity, if you're a part of this entertainment world. Don't believe it for a moment. Satan wants you to believe it. These men didn't miss out on a thing. The Bible says they were ten times better than the others. You see, what they had from God was sufficient. Christians, all that we have from God is sufficient. If we give Him His rightful place, if He is the priority in our knowledge, if He is the priority in us living it out in our character, but thirdly and lastly, this morning, God was the priority in their daily schedule. God was the priority in their daily schedule. Let's go quickly to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. I'm going to read the, the first few verses here. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. It said, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom in hundred and twenty princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. The king thought to set him over the whole realm. And the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. You see, they recognized Daniel's character. They knew what kind of man Daniel was. They knew that Daniel daily met with God. And throughout these next few verses, a, a petition is signed by the king uh, for, for no one to be able to, to pray to another God for the next 30 days. You know, Daniel, the Bible says in, in verse number 9 there, or verse number 10, that Daniel knew when the, the decree had been signed. But Daniel continued to pray. The Bible says he got on his knees three times a day and prayed before the Lord even though he knew it. Don't think for a moment that was an attitude of rebellion. This was a daily activity <coughs> for Daniel. It didn't change. It says there, as he did aforetime. You see, this was vital in Daniel's daily schedule. It was priority in Daniel's daily schedule. These men knew that if we are going to make Daniel fall, if we are going to make Daniel look bad in the eyes of the king, we need to attack him what he is most faithful to, and that's his God. And that's what they went for. Darius gave his approval, and Daniel continued to pray. You know, Daniel could have thought, I've heard the decree. You know what I face if I continue on in my life as a Christian? You know what I face is punishment in a lion's den. Daniel could have thought, lion's den, man, I've heard a lot about lions. A lot of times, especially when those lions are hungry, look out. And then especially when you're in their territory, look out even more. Daniel could have had all these thoughts run through his mind. But you know what? Daniel prayed. Daniel went right to the one that meant the most to him, his best friend, the Lord. It ought to be our best friend, the Lord. He never turns away from us. He never forsakes us. Christians, it's vital we make God the priority in our daily schedule. It's interesting, the men found Daniel praying. I wonder if our prayer life would ever allow somebody to find us praying. You know, maybe our prayer is 10, 15 seconds and now we're gone. Chances are that somebody could have just blinked and our prayer time was done. We see that Daniel was found praying. If we would spend more time praying about our burdens and our desires instead of getting more bitter to God, 
I believe our life would accomplish far more than it does now. If God could have his rightful place, I wonder, does God have the rightful place in your life? We see in the lives of these four men that their priority was God. No questions asked. You'll not change it. You'll not change us. Understand these men went through the teaching. They didn't say, we're not going to sit through the next three years. They went through it. But you know they were prepared for it because they knew the truth. Christians, are we prepared for the things that are ahead of us? Do we know the truth? Or do we just have an idea about it? Do we know it? Do we know the truth? Think about your daily schedule. Maybe you could lay it out on a piece of paper. Write down where God fits in. Figure out how much time God gets in your day. How much time do I give to God? Would it look like God is a priority? Or would it look like something else is a priority? How about on a weekly basis, starting with today, Sunday? How much time does God get throughout the week? Meeting together as a church. The Bible talks about, I'm actually going to preach on it tonight in the book of Hebrews, the, the coming together as a church is vital to our life as a Christian. I know that many of us work, but may we try and make more space for God in our schedules in our weekly schedule. May God more get more, more of a, a bigger block in the schedule. Amen. It's almost like when you go in to, to set up an appointment. If you've ever seen the screens there where they have all the blocks of time for the appointments and how long it takes for that appointment. I wonder if God even gets a little bit of shade on the screen for His part in our day. Maybe we could take something out down here and make room for Him up here. Somehow making more time for Him. I want to read a poem for you. This was something that, uh, Brother Charles, didn't, he'll remember this. this. This was something that was read to us almost every ch elementary chapel time uh, from our elementary principal. I was fortunate to go to a Christian school. I, I always praise the Lord for that. That's a blessing. I know my parents made a great sacrifice. But this was something he read to us and something I've never forgotten, and I found it on the Internet, th this poem. I'm going to read it to you. I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't have time to pray. Problems just tumbled about me, and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on gray and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me, he said, but you didn't seek. I tried to come into God's presence, I used all my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided, My child, you didn't knock. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. Christians, we live a life that can stretch us all over the place. We get so busy and we think I don't have time for God. Think about it. Do you want God's blessing on your day ahead? Take time to pray. Give God His rightful place. God needs the priority in your life. May you give that to Him today. Let's bow our heads for prayer at this time. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet if you're able to this morning. Lord, we do thank You for the blessings of Your Word. Thank you for the challenges that we find in it. Thank you for the examples, stories that we find of men and women that were faithful to you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to heed what you've taught us this morning. Lord, I pray that if there would be someone today that doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, that they would understand their great need of salvation. 